Welcome everybody to Law and Crime Daily. I'm Jesse Weber. We're taking a deep dive into the case of Justin Ross Harris, the father convicted of intentionally leaving his 22 month old son in a blistering hot car near Atlanta, Georgia on purpose. Harris's murder conviction was overturned and now we know we, he will not have to go through a trial again. Let's get you caught up to speed on this case. So in the summer of 2014, Cooper Harris died in his car seat in the back of his father's SUV while his dad went to work. In 2016, a jury found Justin Ross Harris guilty of intentionally leaving his son to die. Georgia's Supreme Court heard arguments for appeal and overturned Harris's murder conviction in 2022. And nearly a year after that decision came down, the Cobb County District Attorney announced that it will not retry this case. Now, Harris left Cooper in the car while he went to work at the Home Depot corporate office. Police say Cooper likely died around noon, and that afternoon, Harris drives around two miles before realizing that his son is in the back seat. He then pulls over at a shopping center and bystanders call 911. Harris was arrested and charged with murder that very night. Search warrants claim that Harris searched for hot car deaths online. The defense argued he clicked on a trending video about dogs dying in hot cars. It's been also revealed that Harris was sexting with at least six women on the day that Cooper died. One of his exchanges was with a 16 year old, so he was also charged with sex crimes. The court moved from moved the trial from at the Atlanta area to coastal Georgia, and a jury found Harris guilty on all counts. Now, this case had the metro Atlanta area area in its grip for months. Ross Cavett was a re reporter in Cobb County who had witnessed every part of this case. I actually had a chance to speak with him on Friday and get his thoughts on the DA's latest decision. This was an interesting uh, case to cover for, for me as a reporter. Uh, because I was out there at the shopping center from the minute it happened all the way through the end of the trial. Uh, so, you know, it was an interesting journey. The district attorney's decision not to retry this case, I understand, because much of what they used to get to the jury where they were has been taken away by the Supreme Court. So I understand the decision. I also understand the emotions involving that. Um, I'm good friends with one of the former prosecutors in that case, who I know he is upset about it. Uh, so I really, I see both sides. Well, I will say this on a personal note, it's nothing, that trial, that whole experience is nothing I would, would want to go through again. This was the difficult case to try for a, a variety of reasons. Uh, you, you had a lot of expert testimony. We tried this hundreds of miles away. Um, it was expensive, time consuming, and um, it took an emotional toll as well. And I think if you put all that together, looking at what they had to, to take to court, looking at the cost, the time, um, you know, that, that's probably why that decision was. All right, joining me now are former trial attorney Terry Austin and special guest criminal defense attorney Mike Korobanix. Mike, I'll start with you. Welcome to the program. You're also a former prosecutor. So what do you think of this decision not to try Harris again? Well, I think it's part of the responsibility as a prosecutor. Trials are not made for people to win or lose. We have an ethical obligation, whether you're a prosecutor or a defense attorney, to make sure the evidence you produce is relevant, it's got credibility and things of that nature. I think this was a good move by the prosecution because the Supreme Court said, regardless of whether you agree or don't agree with it, that this evidence wasn't admissible. And they also too got a conviction on other parts of the case. So he is doing prison time. Right. So I think it does show the, the prosecutor's credibility. Whether you agree with it or not yeah. is irrelevant because when you're in court, the standard's different. It's not what you think. It's what the jury believes beyond the and, reasonable doubt. And the, and the witness doesn't have to be also credible. Right. It's gotta be things that come in. But, but, but Terry, you were convinced there was enough evidence to retry the case. What stood out to you? Well, I understand the decision, but I definitely think there's enough there. Two things, first that timeline, and then also those computer searches. The timeline was when he dropped himself off at work he left his child in the car then he goes to lunch with someone else in another car why is he in another car he probably usually goes in his own car so i think that was some thing that they should have questioned then when it happened when he realized he said he thought wow this his child was in the car he pulls over but his affect they said was really odd so i think that timeline is really interesting and those google searches you can't be searching hot deaths in cars and also you know he apparently was searching other things about you know prison so i think they have something on him well as mike said harris was also convicted on charges related to his sexual activities and the district attorney's office said in a statement quote 
Justin Ross Harris stands convicted of the remaining counts of the indictment, including criminal attempt to commit sexual exploitation of children and dissemination of harmful material to minors. Barring a decision from the State Board of Pardons and Paroles, he will continue to serve his sentence of 12 years on those counts as ordered by the trial court. Well, we're going to take a quick break, but still ahead on Long Crime Daily, our coverage of the reversal of Justin Ross Harris's murder conviction continues. We're taking you inside the Georgia Supreme Court hearing as the justices heard arguments for and against Harris's guilt. That's what it was all about, is painting Justin Ross Harris and his actions in a certain light that took jurors on that trip uh, down motive lane to show them why he may have done what he did and how to get to, to a malice murder charge. That was former Atlanta area reporter Ross Cavett talking about the case of Justin Ross Harris, the once convicted child killer who had his murder part of his verdict overturned by the state Supreme Court. Harris's case captivated people all over the country as word spread about his infidelities and liaisons with multiple women. In fact, at one point, he even told the woman he was sexting with that he would leave his wife if it wasn't for his almost two-year-old two year old son, Cooper, and he would later leave Cooper inside his SUV while he went to work, finding him dead hours later. Despite objections from the defense that inclusion of the extramarital sex and messaging was too prejudicial and irrelevant to the case, it was allowed in. The prosecution held that Harris wanted to have a child-free life, so he killed his son. Cooper died in 2014, and Harris was convicted in 2016. But in January of 2022, the Georgia Supreme Court heard arguments on why Harris's conviction should be overturned. The answer is yes. Viewing the evidence as reasonable jurors would view it, there is a high probability that the sexting messaging evidence did not contribute to the murder verdict if it was erroneously entered in. But that is one of the problems. It's not just that he's having affairs or that he's sexting people or uh, these things like that, but it is the graphic nature how inflammatory that is to a jury when they're back there reading it. And it's not just, you know, you had 10 testifying witnesses. That's not just 10 acts because each one of those witnesses, he had graphic conversations with on numerous occasions. The, the state was allowed to present the, um, the transcripts of the messaging with the photos that were exchanged. And it was photos of men and women being exchanged, um, explicit sexual photos and just some really raw graphic language, and it just kept, kept piling on. Mike, the Supreme Court said that the trial judge shouldn't have allowed or admitted that evidence of the defendant's extramarital pursuits. Can you explain the rationale for that? Well, I think what they were concerned about was that, and I think this comes on more and more now, that we're in a, a, a time of our lives where people text everything quick, is that, you know, quick responses, is that many people talk about many things, but it doesn't necessarily mean without something more to support just the text that that's the activity they went through. Although it's tough for me to really understand this because it seems like there is a connection between these text messages and a motive as to why he wanted to kill his son. It seems like they thought it was really prejudicial. It was going to inflame the passions of the jury instead of really, you know, hitting on the evidence that he wanted to kill his son. I mean, Terry, the Supreme Court decision wasn't unanimous. What do you think? I mean, did they come to the right, right conclusion? You know, this is one of those cases where I think it's about 50-50. I understand the Supreme Court's decision, but it wasn't unanimous. It was 6-3. And I think those dissenters were trying to say, look, it does have something to do with motive. You should be able to let some of this information in, but there's a line where you have to draw. Perhaps you shouldn't show pictures of body parts, but you can show to, you know, demonstrate this timeline to demonstrate what was on his mind at the time that this happened. So I do think that some of that should have gotten in. It reminds me actually of the Alec Murdoch case because frankly those financial crimes that was a big issue. The judge let it in and apparently you know we think it'll be upheld. We don't know but it could be reversed on that same ground. Well, the end of the day is he uh, is going to remain in prison on those remaining counts, but he will not be retried on the murder. So this is a quite an end note to the Justin Ross Harris case.